here's your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you this morning. Praise be to God. Our guest segment in this hour is with John Farrell on annulments, divorce and annulments. Here's an interesting question. Have you ever thought about this? I don't think I have. What is marriage? Like, what's the actual definition according to church teaching, canon law? What is marriage? And here's another interesting question. Have you ever thought about why annulments have increased some 20,000 plus percent since 1968? Why the massive increase in annulments from 1968 and beyond? Uh, We're going to have that conversation with John Farrell about annulments and uh, what the church teaches and why things seem to have changed quite a bit since 1968 in the church in regards to annulments, which have increased, I mean, literally, dramatically. That's not an understatement. That's that's, Maybe it is, actually. Maybe I should be saying it even worse. Uh, It's like some 20,000-plus percent increase in annulments since 1968. Why is that? What is the actual definition, canonically, of marriage? Have you ever thought about that? Uh, I don't think I have. Um, And furthermore, what could bishops do to change all of that if they wanted to? And I think that's the key. Joining us right now via Zoom chat is John Farrell. His uh, website is catholicdivorce.blogspot.com. And we're going to have an interesting conversation about annulments and what the church teaches, what is marriage, why they've increased dramatically since 1968, and maybe what can be done about it. Good morning to you, John Farrell. Buenos dias, Jose. Uh, okay. Can you God. hear me okay? Yes. Amen. It's good to see you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I wanted to start with um, maybe a little bit of your backstory. Uh, all right. You... Here's all right. Listen, I'm I'm a regular guy. I'm a beer drinking, rock and roll, daily mass Catholic. Okay. And five kids married in the church, two thumbs up, all that. But, uh, you know, marriage gets tough now and then, and people get to the bottom of their ego, whatever. So why I'm here talking to you is because I've been raped by the spirit of Vatican II when it comes to divorce and annulment. Are you with me? So my well, let me lovely... First, let me ask you, when did you get divorced? Uh, two, excuse me, 2012. 2012. So, yeah, my— Go ahead. I was just going to ask—I uh, just wanted to get some backstory on that part of your, of your life— uh, um, so you went through a divorce that must have been tragic. I've been I didn't through... go through a divorce. It got imposed on me. You don't go through it. Okay. It either happens or it doesn't. And so, yes, of course it's tragic because it's, 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 uh, emotional dismemberment of your kids. We had five little kids and my wife was found out about annulments. So she looks at me in the kitchen table one morning and says, here's the divorce papers. I would never do this if I thought it was a sin. Mm. Okay, so no one knows if it's a sin or not, because we're good Catholics, right? Divorce isn't a sin. You've heard that before. Only only remarriage without annulment is. You ever heard that? So this is what happened back in 2012. And then I'm saying, this is nuts. So then she says, fine, I'll just have you removed from the house which through the state. So I'm like, I can call the church. Isn't the church? We're married in the church. Don't they have some jurisdiction here? And the, the, the priest says, we don't know. And... The bishop says, basically, I'll pray for you because I have nothing to do with this. This is mere civil effects when you're when you get removed from your house, your your you know, your wife, your kids, all that. So you go to jail or you have to get out of the house. That's what happened. Okay, so that's a real wake up call. You know, if something did that to you, you're like you get religion real fast on what's going on. So I'm like, I smell a rat here. And you go to the bishop and he says, there's there's nothing to say here. It's just a civil effect. I'm like, no, 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 something's not right. So you get on the internet and find out. And that's why we're here today to uh, basically pull the brush the leaves off of the definition of marriage, which has been in, what do you call it? Eclipse. Okay. And so uh, I start realizing that, no, I'm not crazy. And there are more people out there like that. And that's why I'm grateful to be on the air to be able to, you know, uh, I'm like one of the who's in Whoville trying to get the word out. There you go. So John Farrell is our guest. We're going to talk about uh, annulments, marriage. I want to go back to, let's go back 100 years, 50, you know, 70 years, whatever, 200 years, 1,000 years, whatever. Yeah. Let's talk about what marriage uh, and divorce was like in the, let's just call it the proverbial old days. What was it like in the church to be married and if you, if you wanted okay, to divorce Okay, there's, there's a term called wedlock. You've heard that word wedlock. That means you're in it for life. You cannot get out of the lock. So back then, 
it's till death do us part. That means till death you live under the same roof, okay? And that was the case. And of course, Henry VIII wanted something different, and they, he couldn't get the annulment, which he would have gotten today. So back then, wedlock meant wedlock, and it slowly became loosened. And then with the Enlightenment, you start getting the state involved in marriage, which is a sacrament. So you can't, and people are like, no, it's just a state thing. Then what happened over time quickly uh, is, you know, the 20th century, people really started to ramp that up. And then bishops kind of lost their taste for enforcing their exclusive jurisdiction over the marriage contract. It's not a, it's not necessarily a covenant. A covenant and a solemn contract are the same thing. So what it was the perfect storm of they started looking other other way on enforcing uh uh the the jurisdiction over the contract over the separations and then uh on the back side of that in the 1970s they loosened up the definition of consent or vatican ii so now you have um basically no fault divorce for catholics and then you have no definition consent for catholics so it's the perfect storm so marriage has been effectively um canonically how do you put it it's it's been defined out of existence you can't define it right now if you use anything from vatican II onward the legal definition so this is why marriage is in a free for go, free fall go ahead well i was going to ask about the definition in particular did we have a, so we prior to this we had a we had a solid definition but now it's become more loose okay it's very super simple all this annulment being abused stuff that's not the way it is annulments are illegal when it comes to them being based on love Marriage is not founded in love, it's founded in justice. The object of consent is the key term. It's merely physical is the point. Bodily rights to, for, to make babies. That is what the key, that's the object of consent in marriage. It was expanded in Vatican II into a dream within a dream. You, in other words, you, you added the emotional element. The interpersonal relationship is now part of the essence you know, a dog used to be a dog, and now a dog is man's best friend, and you have to legally be your best friend or it's not a dog. So there's, this is how you've expanded the definition of marriage. Vatican II didn't do it um, legitimately. It's, it, it, in other words, they, you cannot change the essence, but hold that ahead. thought. Hold that thought. John Farrell is our guest. We're going to go to a break. We're going to be right back. Continue our conversation on annulments, the changes, the difficulties. Tough subject, but an important one. We'll be right back with John Farrell. Don't go anywhere. Me to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. John Farrell is our guest. His website is catholicdivorce.blogspot.com. Having a conversation about annulments and marriage, the essence of marriage, and why the increase in annulments is pretty scandalous, actually. Uh, welcome back to the show, John Farrell. Uh, before the break, we were getting into sort of the definition of what is marriage and so the essence of it. And I want to start there again um, to get some uh, clarity on this. Okay, here, I'll try to make on, it hold really on, Let me set this up. So let me, I want to set this up. So I want to get the definition, the clarity on what was before and what has now become sort of the essence that they use as the basis to have the conversation oh, okay. uh, for yeah. annulments. Okay, Essence can never change. God can never change. The essence of marriage can never change no matter what anyone says. The essence of marriage is bodily rights. The, uh, the, the, the object of consent is, is purely physical. But the spirit of Vatican II says the object of consent is also interpersonal. So you've added a piece to marriage, which means you cannot define legally interpersonal, you know, partnership and all that stuff, which means Anything can annul a marriage because you cannot consent to it in the first place. It becomes a, it becomes a uh, boyfriend girlfriend relationship legally. You cannot consent to that. So, overnight, uh, you the the amount of annulments in the U.S. increased twenty thousand percent. That's how much it went up, twenty thousand percent from sixty eight to eighty eight. And uh, okay, so that's what we're dealing with. If rule of thumb, if you can have kids, your marriage is valid because that the object of consent is, like I said, purely physical. That's the rule of thumb. I'm willing to talk with anybody about this. Um, there's oh, my dog wants to come in. Come here, dog. So anyway, uh, go. I, I was going to say two things real quick. I want to get across. 
you cannot divorce without the bishop's permission. It's grave sin. If you do that, th this is something a lot of people haven't heard, but more and more people are hearing about it because the church has exclusive jurisdiction over the sacrament. It's in the Third Council of Baltimore that has not been abrogated. Um, so that, that's those are the two points that need I think need to be stressed. Let's stop there and just focus on that real quick because I think that's an important one. I I'm, I hazard to guess that the vast majority of anybody listening to us now or the vast majority of Catholics today have never heard what you just said. So back up and say it again. The people who divorce cannot go to communion. This is how it's done. If you divorce without permission, you are ineligible for communion. The church has always done that until the Beatles, and it sort of fell out of favor, but you cannot change. This is divine law. It, you, it's not mere ecclesiastical law that you need permission from the bishop to divorce. It's divine law. It comes from Trent, Canon 12, and it comes from ultimately the Old Testament. Uh, the, being you know married just for kids only so so that like i said our understanding of marriage is an eclipse and what's gone instead is divorce is not a sin and theology of the body and there's no primary purpose of marriage it's all baloney and marriage is in a free fall so young adrian over there he wants to get married too someday i suppose unless he's going to be a priest so how is he going to consent you need to know marriage for yourself so um um do you see it as a problem that uh, in many parts of our church in the United States, the actual catechesis on marriage is is woefully wanting? No, no. You don't need any more cat. You, you need the defined marriage. You do not need marriage prep at all, because that's all about perfecting the chemistry and all this stuff. It's define marriage accurately. And right now, nobody is defining it. 100% of the U.S. bishops are material heretics regarding marriage. The definition That's a pretty strong statement, John. Oh, I guarantee you, 100%. I have a $10,000 offer to any canon lawyer who can show that I'm wrong right now. That's uh, regarding bishop's permission to divorce or the definition of the essence of marriage. If I had a million dollars, I'd put it up. I will give any canonist ten grand if they can prove me wrong or show that I'm wrong about this. I get no takers. I get blocked. No one will talk about it because the emperor has no clothes. You know how that goes? Uh, within the church. So you talk to anyone at EWTN, Catholic University of America, uh, Catholic Answers, Ed Peters, the head canon lawyer, I call him America's Pope, any of those people, the answer is no comment. And that's what modernists do. So they stop I talking. Th I think the piece in this particular part of the conversation that we haven't put onto the table yeah. to give greater, greater context here is that at some point the church gave over to the state the ability to uh, decide divorces and the bishops the church, at that point. Yes, the church never gave it over. Hello, it's a sacrament. It's like getting the church. Well, that's my over. point. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Correct. What happens is the church kind of looked the other way and they're going to outsource confession and the Eucharist too to the state. No, you can't outsource marriage either. The contract and the sacrament cannot be separated. It's in Arcanum, it's in Casti Canubi, you cannot give the contract to the state and the annulment to the church. They must go together. So there are no divorces before the annulment. Everything must go through ecclesiastical, the bishop. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what about annulments in other parts of the world? How does the United States compare? The United States is obviously the annulment capital by far. We have 90% of the world's annulments and 6% of the Catholic population. So if you go to Sri Lanka or Nigeria or something, there's almost no annulments. And they tell you, if you divorce, you can't go to communion. So that's it. In other words, there's places where it's still sane, but the, in the, it started, it got the whole, just like communion in the hand, the whole thing got started in the Netherlands. And they, they came out in the seventies and said, knock this off. You can't do it. And they did it anyway. So now even Cardinal Burke and everybody will tell you the essence of marriage includes the good of the spouses. They're wrong. They won't. I'm telling you, man, it's this is what's going on. And I'm so I'm doing. Go ahead. Are we all, oh, I have to keep track of the time here. We're going to run out of time right. very fast. Let's move on to what could be done if if the church, let's assume for the second that, uh, that the that tomorrow, all of a sudden, bishops decide, you know what, we're going I to do the answer. thing. Are you ready? What could they do? OK, you do the Catholic version of marriage savers, which is the Protestant thing. that. So but you you so you have. You, when you want to have separations, let's say someone's having a problem in the parish with separation, they, the, the, wet, the marriage, you have the local, the, the bishop deputizes 
the pastor and deputizes different people to basically hold separation court right there. So they say, look, in other words, you adjudicate the separation because you cannot, you, you have a right to live with your wife and she has a right to live with you. You don't get to break that. So the answer is, you, you, you call it like the, the marriage union, for example, you, you, you bring it back local. That's what used to be done back in the 50s. Uh, you can, it can even be laid, we have, you can have civil lawyers judge the thing, let them judge it. This is, and then for those people who are, say, I'm not going to go along with this, there's no communion. So you get a ticket to hell if you want to walk out of your sacrament. Right now, you get communion and you get an annulment and a new, a new spouse. So marriage has no, there's nothing to marriage right now, which is why people are like, why get married? John Farrell is our guest. Uh, his website is catholicdivorce.blogspot.com. And uh, I can imagine there are people all over the country who have found themselves in this situation. Have they been reaching out to you? Have you been connecting? Lots. Sure, yeah. And there's, there's different resources to help them because they can't get this information anywhere. You, you you talk to your priest and they they it, because they'll say it's re, marriage is emotion based or love based. There's nothing we can do. No, it's justice based. The church has you have a right to a trial for separation. So we need to assert that and bring that to their local tribunal instead of just the annulment. So anyone want to get in touch with me? I'm the easiest guy in the world to do so through Facebook, Twitter. I'll give you my email, whatever. We could talk about it. And basically, I've had to learn this the hard way. And I want to help people who basically get blindsided by Catholic divorce and where their rights are and what they can do. So is there something they can do? I guess that's the question. If what you're saying, what you're telling me is accurate, and I have no reason to assume otherwise, that bishops aren't even willing to touch this third rail, then where could, where could they possibly go? They have to, they have to learn. The answer is they have to take it to their their tribunal and their bishop anyway. They have to ed they have to say, this is a sacrament. Exclusive jurisdiction over this sacrament belongs to the church. It's a lie that it's mere civil effects when they tell your kids where your kids are going to live. This is natural law and it's divine law. Mm -hmm. You have to take marriage back from the state that has been stolen while the bishops who are supposed to be protecting it look the other way and throw annulments at the problem. It's evil. They are known as enemies of marriage in Casti Canubi 78. Okay. This is what's going on. And, and so once you get a little knowledge, which is a dangerous thing, you can start knocking at the door and saying, I want my marriage back. And I want you to vindicate and defend my right to be with my family, because that's what was in other words, your wife could do the same thing to you right now, Joe. What are you going to do? You got to know where your rights are and what marriage is. It's not just a dream within a dream. It's not. We have about uh, two minutes left in our conversation with John Farrell. His website, again, is catholicdivorce.blogspot.com. Um, so what would you leave us with? What could, I mean, how could we positively have an, an effect here on this issue? Okay, I'll help you with that question. Someone who wants to get married has to own the definition themselves. They have to learn what the wedlock is and where the lock is, meaning you have to waive your right to no-fault divorce. When you're going to get married, you want to say, if we're going to engage in this contract, this solemn contract, there are terms, which means the object of consent is to make kids, and that if we divorce or separate long-term or permanent without permission, we're not going to heaven. So there it is. There's the wedlock that no one's talking about. You cannot take your divorce to heaven with you, okay? You've got to solve it in the external form, which means not confession. You cannot take your sin of divorce to confession. It must be done at the tribunal or with a ecclesiastical judge. It's, it's reserved for the bishop. So to try to keep it positive and what are we going to do? Learn what marriage is, then you can go for it. But you can't get the information from marriage prep because they don't even define it, okay? We're, it, we're free falling without the information. So you can also go to um, uh, uh, marysadvocates.org. That's the best That's the best website I can think of. There's so much right. information. We are out of time. John Farrell, catholicdivorce.blogspot.com or marysadvocate.org. Thank you, John, for your time today. God bless you and God love you. Have a great love day. Love you, baby. Thanks, George. 
difficult uh, show today in the first hour, of course. Uh, touchy subject just to begin with. And then, of course, our guest, I think, was, was uh, you know, he was on fire for sure, but clearly is very broken by, the, by his divorce. And my heart breaks for him from that perspective. But he was, tr- he was trying to share information that I guarantee nobody's ever heard before on the topic of annulments, which is why we wanted to have that conversation. But I think it was evident that uh, John is, is somebody, somebody who is uh, very hurt by the brokenness of his marriage. And that's true for countless people who find themselves in broken marriages. And that's part of the tragedy of our modern age, the, the sheer uh, landscape of broken marriages. And then, of course, broken children who go on to perpetuate the brokenness. And uh, to stop that, holiness is always the answer. But he had, he had information on, on the change in annulments from before and after that most people had never heard of. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, but it was, uh, it was an interesting conversation all the same. Josh says, the sacrament of marriage is in need of defense so much in our time. Glad y'all had him on, even if he was a bit impassioned. A bit? <laughs> Josh, you're very kind. <laughs> that guy, obviously, uh, I feel bad for him. I mean, uh, I, mean I, f- I feel for him. I guess I can empathize with him. You know, it, divorce is horrible. Divorce is painful. It, it breaks people. And he, I think we're, we saw some of that. He is clear the example of what uh, divorce can do to a person. Yeah. The mm-hmm. effects of it. Uh, clearly, he didn't want it, but um, he's going through something, and this is his cross to bear. And some of us bear our crosses uh, better than others. Yeah. His message is, is, this is in need of change. It needs to be looked at. We need to, you know, wake up to um, this process you know, the divorce, and where, uh, where our church needs to further help us. I also feel, going back to, to you, Anna, mm-hmm. uh, by the way, Anna's here. Good morning to you, Anna. Good morning. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, I, I, I also feel like part of the problem is I've tried to bring this up in the conversation uh, with John, but he, he wasn't really having it, but mm-hmm. uh, about formation like preparing couples. You know, when my own son was preparing to be married, uh, the priest, whom I know very well, called me and we had a great conversation, asking me about, you know, where, where my son was at. And, and it, was, it was so good, it was so healthy, it was so good. You know, and I liked that process very, very, very good because it wasn't about this lengthy, you know, months on end of, of come to class or whatever, but it was more about this is what marriage is. Do you understand that? Do you, do you get that? Like, that was the nature of the, that conversation, the nature of that time that my, spent, my son spent with this priest. And I'm like, that's what we need more of. Like, w- do you understand what you're getting yourself into? Do you get what actual marriage is? And I have to say that having participated in uh, marriage preparation, my wife and I up in New Hampshire for many years uh, participated in a, a pre canon conference. And... I myself sat there in that chair before I got married trying to check a box and not listening in one ear out the other. I, I, what you can, you got to say what you say, you say it. Good. You're done. Check that box. I did this priest now marry us. And I'll never forget the seconds before my wife walked down the aisle, the priest turned to me and said, would you like to go to confession? And I went, no. And he said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, begin. <laughs> you know, and I was like, ah, what do I do? What do I say? I don't, I mean, we had been pre, we cohabitated. We committed all these sins. We, my heart was not convinced of the truth of the Catholic Church. You know, I wasn't intellectually or emotionally convinced of it. I was trying to just get married to, to this woman. I didn't, uh, didn't see marriage from the church's eyes. And, um, and yet we still got married. My, my marriage is valid. It's, it's a sacrament, and I can't use that as my excuse to get a divorce or annulment. However, how many times couples have been just checked through the process? How, wouldn't it be awesome if a priest stopped them and said, do you truly understand what you're getting yourself into? And then like had a really candid conversation with them. And then uh, how many marriages wouldn't proceed and then end up in annulments, especially those with prenups? Good grief. That's an obvious sign. How many priests would have just said no, just evaluated the couple and said, no, just by, you know, you're not. No, come back, you know, 
uh, you're doing this, you're doing that, come back to me in, in such and such time if you still want to get married and you need to prepare for, for this spiritually because it really is a spiritual battle. Yeah. When you, yeah. Go, when you go into it, then, then, the, then you know, the, you're hit hard spiritually. Yeah, and, and I think— and, and you don't really know somebody, and that's just the thing. You don't know somebody until you live with them. That's true and all, but at the same time, it's a it, it's a, a choice you make, right? You have to, and you know, and choices. I think that was part of the message we wanted to have in our conversation with John today. That got overshadowed by his clear brokenness and emotions over the topic, right? And that is, um, we can't give ourselves the get out of jail free card. Marriage is a commitment, it's a covenant, and the choice we make is not one we can just back out on because things don't work out or the spouse is imperfect or, or what have you. And I, you know, it's John, Mike brings up this good point in the con box here. He says, uh, God hates divorce. That's direct scripture right there. God hates divorce. He says, I have no doubt about it. No one comes out unscathed. Yea, yea and amen. He says, Ephesians 5.23 says, a man is the head of the household as Christ is the head of the church. Can you imagine Christ divorcing us? And that's the point I want to bring out right now. <clears throat> this is the point that I always come back to when I've talked to men who, are, who I've had the chance to speak to before they've you know, pursued divorce in their, in their marriages. I always try to bring this point out. I've even had this conversation with a priest friend of mine many, many years ago now who told me he was, being, he was asking to be laicized and to leave the priesthood. And I said this same argument to him. You are married to the church. You are a priest. And he goes, well, I wasn't supposed to be. That is not the point mm -hmm. anymore. It is, it is beyond the point at this stage of the affair that you, th that you weren't supposed to be. Hands were laid. The sacrament was received. The ontological shift has happened. The change within you has happened. You are a priest now and forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And now you want to back out because now you want to go and act like a layperson? I mean, he and I had this conversation. I brought up this very point. You are a priest. Or I would say to a man, you are married, but she doesn't this, and she, this thing doesn't that. And you yep. are married. What can we do at this point to fix, repair, change, to uh, make better the marriage? Too many times we may give ourselves a pass, and we say this, this, and that, and then we back out. But the reality is marriage occurred. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the conversation we wanted, but yeah. unfortunately, it got overshadowed. Yeah, Elizabeth's comment or Betty's comments, <laughs> his marriage diminished, his message diminished the fullness of what marriage is. Who would be attracted to it? It is a body, it is a body contract. Well, that's not that's not what he was trying to do. The the point that was trying to be made is that at the end of the day, everything else doesn't matter once you're married. Like obviously. And clearly, everybody would agree that you should marry someone that you love. You should marry someone that you can uh, see yourself living your life with, someone that you're passionate about, that y'all agree with each other on things. But at the end of the day, once the marriage happens, well, you're married now. And that's the point that he was trying to make. He was saying, whatever feelings you did or did not have, at the end of the day, don't matter because you need to have something that's objective that cannot change. And that's the contract that you have <laughs> with your spouse. And no matter what emotions you did or did not have, um, those things have now are, are no longer relevant in the in terms of not no longer relevant completely, but in terms of whether or not your marriage is valid. And that's the point that was trying to be made. It wasn't trying to say that you should uh, all marriage is is a bodily contract. Yeah. Um, has, that's definitely not the point that's trying to be made. Uh, and I think uh, that's very important for us to understand because yeah, we we all agree. Like I'm Joe. I'm sure you love your wife. I have no doubt in my mind. I have no doubt in my mind that you would sacrifice your life for your wife uh that that's not even even a question um but at the end of the day all those other things are less important and in terms of what mar uh, whether or not your marriage is valid well you know because i've come from so much divorce in my family and so much brokenness in my family and the pain of having to live through that as a child uh, i made the commitment after my conversion experience i i committed myself uh, to to Christ and to his church, but I made a personal commitment that I would never remarry under any circumstances whatsoever, that I would remain, if, if it would be God's will, that my wife should either leave me and or, uh, God forbid, that she should pass before me, that I would remain chaste and celibate for the remainder of my life. I made that commitment because, to me, I needed that commitment uh, because of my background, because of my history, because of my family 
I needed to make that kind of a commitment. That level was necessary for me uh, because that's how I work. I'm, it's easy for me to be either on or off. It's easy, easy for me to be black and white. It's the gray area that's the nuance that becomes very difficult for people like me. So I made that commitment and I have told my wife and my kids, I've said to them that no matter what happens, I will be married and, and will love their, their mother until I die. And beyond that, I should love her even further because I will prayerfully, God's will, be in the beatific vision and therefore perfected. And I think that's necessary. Um, and, you know, to Mike's point here on the chat box, he also says, we have to recognize that John's pain is a direct result of failure, failure of leadership, intentionally or unintentionally. Our church let him down in his most vulnerable moment. And I do agree with that. I, I do agree with that. I think that was part of, of what kind of got overshadowed in the conversation was the church has sort of let go of this supreme um, opportunity to regulate this, uh, this sin and scandal in society by managing this process. So I'm using that, you know, in a loose way. Um, it's kind of gotten out of control now. And now the who's, who are you going to turn to? Uh, these bishops apparently don't want to touch this third rail. They don't want to go there. And that's part of the scandal, and I, that's you know the part of why we wanted to talk to him. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. Josh had a great comment. What do you say? Josh said, um, "We used to live in a society that valued the sanctity of getting married and staying married." Dr. Jordan Peterson refers to this as a forced monogamy. He said, "I'd rather have my parents had stayed. I'd rather my parents had stayed together and been less happy." than having been abandoned by my father. Yes, I make that point all the time. I get in trouble for making that point. Kids, and I even, when I, in my film, The Other Side of Fear, uh, which you can watch for free, by the way, it's over at livinghislife.net. Highly recommend. Uh, you can also watch, it's on Vimeo as well. It's always free, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, I, when I asked uh, Dr. Ken Buckle, clinical psychologist, about the stats on divorce and remarriage, the effects on kids, this was the point that came out. Studies have shown, he said, it didn't used to be that way. They didn't used to think this way, the clinical psychology. They, they thought kids would be fine because they're resilient. They can handle it. And that's the lie that I got fed down my throat as a kid. Oh, you'll be fine. You want your parents to be happy, don't you? And of course, as a kid, you're like, of course I want my parents to be happy. But the studies have shown kids would actually prefer two parents even arguing and mean to each other in the same house than to have a broken home. They prefer, if they had to choose the lesser of two evils, if they weren't given a better option, they would prefer them to stay in the house than to be separated. I think that should be telling to us. We, we can give them more than just the bottom line. We can give them something greater. We have to teach that. We have to believe that. We have to live that in the church and the community wide. That doesn't mean that there aren't terrible situations in marriages that lead to this brokenness and, and contributing factors. Of course there are. Let's pray for those that are in these situations and let's, let's journey with them as well. But let's hold the ground on the truth. I think that's the real key. At any rate, God love you. God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for hanging out with us. Tough, tough topic, but I'm glad we discussed it. God bless you. We'll see you back here tomorrow, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern for Catholic Drive Time.